Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think, first of all, I'd like to uh, start off by saying that uh, John Angela Cruz's, uh, uh Maria's uh, father, uh, was certainly an icon in this industry, and probably one of the most successful and highly respected uh, ship owners of our time. So I'd like to just ask everyone for you know, a moment of silence in his memory. Thank you. Talking about your dad, and I'm reading from the transcript of the interview that I had the uh, honor of doing in 2016. Uh, Michael, firstly, let me just say I wanted to thank you for inviting me here today and to the organizers of the Marine Money event. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many of you here. It's a true honor to be here, you know, especially as we said, five years after my father said on this very same chat. You know, so I, I'm excited. Great. Uh, at that 2016 interview, uh, I asked him about you. He said he was proud and happy of your decision to join the company. He said that you were working well together while admitting there were some occasional speed bumps. <laughs> your dad stated that he wished that he could make mistakes. You could make mistakes while he was around and believe you were far more conservative in taking risks. Even though he knew that you had a dual role as a wife and a mother, he hoped you would stay focused on shipping and never forget that your reputation should never be compromised. What are your thoughts about your father's comments? What are the key leadership lessons that he taught you and how has it helped you now that you've taken over the company? Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, my father and I worked together for 13 years and you know, during that time, we didn't always see eye to eye on everything. But in general, we shared the same philosophies together and we had a brilliant time. It was just a lot of fun. And I will always look back on it uh, to those memories. In terms of leadership lessons, you know, I could go on for days. So I'll try, uh, try and be succinct. Um, as I said, I joined 13 years ago as a junior doctor. Uh, and my intention was to work for a year in the company and then return to the medical profession. But my, I had promised to my father that I would give him a year in the business. So the first one, I guess, is always keep your word. And um, <laughs> that is why I'm here today. Uh, from the very first day, my father gave me a lot of autonomy, a lot of independence to learn from his people. Um, and this allowed me to grow rapidly in knowledge, in confidence, and also to have a passion for shipping. And I think it's an industry where you have to be passionate yeah, to be in it. Um, his father had allowed him to make business decisions, business decisions he didn't necessarily agree with and to make mistakes. And this is what he did to me as well. He said, look, don't worry about making mistakes, learn from them. And, you know, make these mistakes when I'm around because I won't be around forever. And, you know, sadly, that is very true. Another thing for him was always to keep his door open uh, in his office, he, uh, to listen to people carefully. Uh, he said, be accessible to your people. Don't let them be scared to come and show you or tell you when there's a problem. Um, another main one was, you know, that this company is its people. Uh, he said, forget about the ships, forget about the money. The, the thing that is important about this company is our people in the office and our people in the vessels. Now, you know, you're a medical doctor. I have more, but I won't let you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you're a medical doctor, which is probably one of the highest uh, professions, saving lives. Why did you choose shipping? As I mentioned to you, um, I uh, promised my father a year in the business. And in that time, I really started to enjoy it. I found it fascinating. It's a very people-orientated business. You're constantly meeting new people. There are problems to solve. It's never dull. And um, at the end of the day, you are at the very forefront of what's going on in the world. You're carrying goods and energy around. You understand global trade, and I found that fascinating. Now, talking about your company, you have um, about 150 ships uh, equal, 
about equally balanced among tankers, dry cargo, and gas, LNG tankers. Uh, your grandfather focused on dry cargo, then your dad came in and he added tankers and gas. And uh, the question is, do you have a favorite sector? And uh, will you remain diversified or lean in one direction or the other? Uh, I don't think I have a favorite sector. I, I started off a, a, on the tanker side, so that was maybe the one I was most familiar with at the beginning, but they all have their pluses and minuses. Um, at the moment, as you say, it's true, it's correct that we are equally split roughly in numbers between oil tankers, LNG carriers, and dry bulk. But in terms of the value, um, Moran Gas makes up about two thirds of the value of the fee. So that is our sort of largest commitment. Historically, in the 13 years I've been in the business, I've seen good markets, bad markets, and how these sectors help each other. So I really believe that diversification helped us become successful. Uh, one market supported the other. And overall, you know, these three sectors complement each other. One of the biggest sizes, they're industrial energy carriers. Uh, I think we will remain diversified. But that's not to say that we'll stay in the same sectors. And I really believe that in 10 years' time, our fleet will look very different for how it looks today. I think there's also the risk of over-diversifying. My father and I constantly talked about different sectors, should we go into something. Um, his advice was, don't spread yourself too thinly. Don't go into too many things that you can't concentrate on. And also try and be significant in the sector you're in. It was a surprise, uh, certainly to me, and I'm sure everyone in this room, that you recently employed the deputy chief executive. Why are you going to I think delegate in, more and more? Um, I, look, I'm, I'm here to stay, and I think I've made that clear from, from the beginning, after my first year of uh, learning about shipping and understanding it. Uh, after my father's death, I felt it was really important to have a period of stability in the company. Um, I had a lot of support from everyone on, on, in the office, on the ships, and that was incredibly important you know, for me to be here today. But as things calmed down, I felt I needed to think carefully about what I needed for the long term. Um, and Tonight and Scholar, who will be joining us in the new year, brings great experience and depth of knowledge in the energy sector, in the energy sector, and a very long-term view. So he'll be helping with the bigger picture strategy stuff, but also the commercial relationships. So I think it will be a great addition. Good. Uh, talking about LNG, LNG is considered by most the transitional fuel between oil and renewables. Uh, you are focused on this area, and uh, you recently ordered two firm ships, and I think you have a few options there. They will delay 2024 delivery, and uh, well, do you envision additional vessels? To start with your comment about LNG as a transition fuel, um, I believe LNG is a bit more than that. I think not only is it a bridge between oil and renewables, but I think it'll be there as an energy source for decades to come and will likely make up a significant part of the final energy mix. Um, it is the cleanest fossil fuel. It has, as we know, 25% less carbon dioxide emissions, 90% less NOx emissions, negligible SOx emissions. There's abundant supply and there's also an infrastructure that's set up. The world needs to wean itself off coal as quickly as possible. And in my humble opinion, at least, I believe that LNG provides a great baseline for the renewable sector to be able to ramp up in the future. Um, we see it now with carbon capture and storage coming on, on land, hopefully on board ships as well, with the regulations to eliminate methane flaring and venting and the leaks, that this will make the LNG value chain even, even better. Also now, we're discussing bio-LNG, e-LNG, and this gives us a very visible pathway to getting there on net zero. So we believe in it as a fuel, we believe in it as an energy source. Um, at the end of last year, my father and I uh, speculatively ordered four dual fuel VLCC tankers. Uh, we wanted more, but we ended up with the four. Um, 
these are delivering in 23 and we were very careful about designing a spec and yeah, leggy engines which gives them a negligible methane slip superior energy consumptions and i believe they'll be you know some of the best environmentally friendly tankers in the region um, uh, going back to lng for a second this year there have been 67 according to our count uh, vessels ordered for them by Mar in 2021. Uh, about 20% of these ships are uncommitted. Of course, today's freight rates are at record highs. Uh, and how do you feel about all these uncommitted ships and uh, how this market is going? Is it, it, do you think it's going in the right direction? Um, I believe the LNG market will be strong for a number of years. There will definitely be volatility, especially in the seasonal downturns. It is a large percentage of the order book, but as we all know in the LNG world, there's a lot of uncertainty about steamships. What will happen with them? Will they have to slow steam? So um, I'm not nervous about it. You know, I think it, I think it will be a good market for a number of years to come. Uh, recently. The, the vessels, the two-stroke uh, vessels, you order two-stroke vessels, Maggie, uh, why? We um, had carefully considered what the best technology to order for our new building is. And every time at Moran that we order a new ship, we're constantly looking about how we can improve its efficiency, reduce its emissions, make the spec even better. And not only have we ordered Maggie, but we've ordered the new engine system of Maggie that makes it even more efficient that is the first of the first vessels to be ordered. These will have a negligible methane slip, um, or reduced carbon dioxide emissions, and they're very, very efficient. So I believe they will be the best ships on the water when they get delivered. Okay, so now talking about Marin, uh, many shipping companies separate commercial and technical side of their business. Your company has always been an integrated ship owner, keeping all aspects of the business in-house. Do you still think this is the best approach or could you see a change in that in the future? My father created the company that he inherited from his father to do everything in-house. We designed the ships, we supervised them, we operate them, crew them, technically manage them. And we believe that this gives uh, ASGL the ability to provide the best in class service to our chargers. So, for the time being, you know, I think there's some great advantages in doing things in house. Uh, private equity and hedge funds and banks continue to invest in shipping. Your father accepted the trend, but didn't believe these investors were truly committed to providing the necessary first-class service to charterers. What are your thoughts? Would you ever consider partnering with them? I recall in 2001, you had a public vehicle. How about the possibility of going public again? So starting on, on the private equity side, look, I think with all the monetary stimulus that uh, so many countries have had uh, post the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a lot of money in the market and we see private equity funds, infrastructure funds entering the shipping market. Um, as traditional ship owners, uh, they have a slightly different outlook, but they're here and, and we accept them. Um, I find it hard to understand how their investment model works with long-term strategic partnerships, best-in-class service, and in-house operations that we do. Um, but and who knows how long they'll be? Uh, would we partner with them? Uh, not for the time being, but you never know how things change. Uh, coming to the public markets, you know, as you said, my grandfather uh, listed our company was one of the first shipping companies to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. 14 years later, my father took it private um, and he instilled in me the difficulties and challenges he had in doing that. Um, over the years, we've looked at IPOs or MLPs. Uh, we've been fortunate enough not to need financing from that sector. So for the time being, it, it is our intention to remain private. 
Uh, for me, the advantages of being private is flexibility, quick decision making, essentially we're masters of our own destiny. And in addition, uh, the vast majority of profits made from Angela Pisa's shipping group are reinvested back in the company. Uh, you mentioned COVID-19. What impact has COVID-19 had on your company? What are the challenges that you had to deal with? crew changes, et cetera. And how did you manage them so successfully? And do you see any long-term issues that will remain a factor in the future? So quite a few questions. <laughs> I think firstly, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected each and every one of us, and certainly everyone in this room, probably most people on the globe. Um, our biggest challenge by far has been our crew. Uh, at the beginning, I remember when the pandemic hit, being on a ship was the safest place to be. And then as the months dragged on, um, we were trying to get people off. You know, crew have to rest, they have to be returned to their families. Ports were shot, they wanted the cargoes, but they didn't want the crew changes. So it was a very real challenge, it's still going on. It's maybe a bit better, but not as much as it should be given, you know, vaccinations uh, around the world. Seafarers in general are a very resilient group of people, but everyone has their limits. So I think what we did, first of all, we um, bolstered our in-house medical department to three full-time doctors. We created quarantine hubs in Manila and Dubai, uh, where we had some control over people quarantining before they came on board the ships. I think we were one of the first companies to provide onboard antigen testing kits on board. And I believe we're one of the first maritime companies to have developed a custom-made occupational well-being app both mental and physical well-being for our seafarers. So it's a challenge, it's still going on, and, and by far the main thing is keeping our crew safe. Beyond that, I think COVID has changed trade flows, it's created operational efficiencies, and fundamentally changed the way we work. Some of this will be here to stay, some of it will go back to normal. Uh, I think as we're running out of time, I have to ask the question, what do you think will be the biggest challenges facing our industry today, what are they? As I mentioned, short term, it's keeping our crew healthy, safe and happy. Long term, it's the energy transition. You know, this is something that at ASGL, we are working on decarbonizing uh, our shipping fleet as part of the energy transition. I don't believe this is optional, this is essential. Uh, and we have to work to do it as quickly, but also as safely and reliably as possible, uh, whilst continuing to carry goods and energy around the world. So that for me is the biggest challenge. We have a plan and a strategy that we will implement in the years to come, but it will be you know, a lot of work and a lot of interesting opportunities. I have to ask this last question. How do you feel being a woman in a still pretty much male-dominated industry? Um, I feel fine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know I came from a hospital environment, you know, where you know, there probably were more women, but ever since I've worked here, I've never felt, you know, my gender to be an issue. Uh, in our company, we are promoting more and more women. We had our first female captain on a cake size in the world, the first female captain on an LNG carrier, our managing director of Land Gas is, uh, is a brilliant woman who you know, has worked in the company for years. So on a personal note, I've never felt it to be an issue. You know, and I hope others you know, in our company will feel the same. I thank you. Any last comments you'd like to make when we run out of time here? Um, I want to leave one final point about my father before I thank you uh, on the leadership because um, I didn't get to say that. I think one of the best things my father did was that he always saw the glass as half full. Uh, people might have called him an eternal optimist, but he wasn't quite that, but he just saw opportunity in everything. And he always could look at something in a certain way and make the most out of it, which I thought was a brilliant skill. When markets were bad, he ordered chips, he bought shares, he was calm, and he had a long-term view, you know, and, and I'd love to have that skill one day. 
No, based on what I heard, I think you have it. So, <laughs> please. I just wanted to say yes. something. Yes. And Michael, thank you also. You know, you have been a personal friend to my father for so many years. You've given him honest, wise business advice. You know, he truly valued you as a friend, and I wanted to thank you for that. It was my pleasure. Thank you very, very much.